It's the final hours for our December special sale. I'll get to that in just a second. But first, I'm going to give away a free workout program. MAPS Aesthetic <laughs> is free for one of you lucky viewers, but you got to do this. You got to leave a comment the first 24 hours that we drop this episode. Subscribe to this channel. Turn on your notifications. If we pick your comment, we'll notify you, and you'll get free access to MAPS Aesthetic. Okay, back to the special. There's only a few hours left as of the dropping of this episode for the 50% off sale MAPS Hit and the 50% off MAPS Split. So they're both half off right now. If you're interested, head over to mapsfitnessproducts.com and then use this code DEC50 for 50% off either one or both of those programs. All right, here comes the show. Here's your fitness tip today. TV is making you fat. Mm. What do you is think that about that? New news? Yeah, I don't know. Yeah. I don't, the way you said it was kind of weird. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so, no, here's, here's no. Seriously though, this has been, um, uh, and it wasn't it didn't happen until later. Uh, one of the the single best pieces of advice that I gave uh, clients that were trying to lose weight uh, without putting them on diet restrictions, right? Without yeah. saying, hey, you have to do this or cut these calories. Just simply saying, listen, here's here's one one rule I want you to live by for the next month and just see what happens is don't eat in front of the television or your phone. Uh, like just, just non-distracted eating. Yeah. It, and it blew my mind how many people became so much more aware. It's very similar to the advice that before social media became so popular, so that the advice we used to give where I'd tell someone just to track. Like just becoming aware, yeah, it automatically makes you start to make better decisions because many times we're so unaware of what we're even doing, and I think today's time we're distracted more than we've ever been. Mm -hmm. So instead of giving a client these crazy restrictions and saying you can't do this, can't do that, or follow this meal plan, just saying, hey, let's first do this, let's cut out some of these bad habits that that don't allow you to be aware of your body's natural yeah. signals that are trying to tell you. You've Isn't it enough. hilarious that you have to actually visually watch the food go in to your mouth and mm. that'll make a massive impact? Yeah. <laughs> I like to watch it when you eat it. I know. Uh, I, you know what really, when they do studies on this, they, they find people reduce their calories by 10 to 15% just by not being distracted. Yeah. Just because they're and what it is, yeah, it's definitely awareness. But really, what's the way it's, they explain it is, you get signals from, you know, hormones that your body releases, like ghrelin, and you know, as your stomach stretches, your your brain will get signals. But if you're focused on something else, it doesn't register as quickly, yeah. and you end up eating. And someone might think, oh, 10 percent more calories. What is that? Well, if you eat 400 calories, it's 40 more calories. And you add it up throughout the day. Yeah, and if you it's, always it's two three hundred calories a day, and if you always eat in front of the TV, which mm -hmm. a lot of people or today, on front of your phone, and I, I'm guilty. I'm by the way, I'm guilty of this. Or I think even uh, driving their car. A lot of advice like this, I think, uh, what ends up happening is you know I see it in my own behaviors, and I think, okay, I'm a fitness professional. I'm aware of these things. Yep. Uh, this I slip up on this, so my clients <laughs> have got to. They because they're not thinking about fitness like I'm thinking about it 24 seven. And if this gets me caught up, you got to think the average person who's not thinking about fitness all day. It's not their career. Uh, this probably happens a lot. Yeah, you, you want to know what's funny is uh, uh, now I'm thinking back. Right, my oldest son was he wasn't the best eater when he was a kid, and um, you know, in, in my culture, like that's uh, that's a bad that's bad that's not good. Right, so you got to make sure he eats more. Right. And when they would, when my son would get fed by his grand, both either one of his grandmas, what they would do to get him to eat more is they would distract him with television, mm -hmm. and then he'd watch the TV, and then the spoon would go in front of his mouth, and he'd, uh, he'd just open it and eat the food. So it was like, and I, I mean, looking back now, it's clear what was happening is we were they were he was being distracted so we could feed him. It's or make sure he funny food. that you just said that because. What made like I told the guys today like oh I have the fitness tip. What made me think about this and why this was on my mind was exactly that. I'm guilty of this, so I'm guilty of using the iPad to kind of distract Max to get him to like just sit still and eat. And it's and I've used that as a tool so many times that so last night Katrina and I were like oh the house we we we've, we've got a lot everything done we're kind of relaxing well we're all gonna have dinner together. And, you know, instead of, because uh, what happens right now is we normally feed Max and then Katrina and I have our dinner afterwards mm -hmm. um, by ourselves. And instead we're like, oh, let's have dinner as a family today. And obviously for having dinner as a family, there's no reason to have iPad on the table or anything like that. And so it, it disrupted that normal pattern that we do with mm -hmm. him. 
and he wasn't having it. Mm. And I was like, oh, fuck, look what I did. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Look at, look at, I just did is I've, al I've allowed us to make that a, 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 a kind of a ritual for when he's eating so he could sit down there and watch his cartoons and eat his food. And it, anybody that's done that with their kid, they know that it's like nice because it gets them to settle down and sit still and they're not. Well, so nice. food, food manufacturers, I don't know whether they did this on purpose or, you know, maybe on accident. I don't know, but they started to, because remember TV didn't exist. Up until well, widespread up until probably what the sixties and seventies. Doug, how, how when do you think TV started becoming kind of commonplace in American homes? Would you say it's probably the seventies and sixties? When did you stop listening 60s, to the radio probably, for your right? entertainment? Doug? <laughs> you got to remember, I grew up with no TV. Oh, that's right. So I'm the wrong person to ask. Yeah. But I mean, I think the TV first came out in the fifties, right? It did, but yeah. it really didn't become commonplace I, like seventies. Like uh, yeah, when was it? When was it? Because like now the average home has like two point three or something. There's like yeah. there's more televisions than children in homes, right? That's the yeah. average. Maybe you could look that up. I'm gonna look this up because I don't know the answer. Yeah, but I. So what happened was TV became it was this new thing, right? It's like oh my gosh, you got movies in your in your house, and then there's all this broadcasting. What's going on? And they started to design and create foods. Yeah. TV dinners. TV dinners became a thing. You remember yeah. that, right? Yeah. They don't really make Hungry those. Man and all that kind of stuff. They don't yeah. really. Then, go ahead, Doug. And the TV trays. Yeah, so it was only around 9% of Americans owned TVs in the 1950s, but by 1960, that figured, figure had jumped to over 80%. There you go. So, and so, and then you started to see. You said by the 80s, is that what you said? No. No, 60s. 1960s. 60s. Yeah, very 1960s. Fast. Yeah. Okay, very wow. fast. Made an and then today would be a neat stat to look up is what the average, how many TVs are in the average American home now? Like there's now, it's not, it went from very rare for someone to have mm -hmm. it to most 80% of the Americans have it to now most people have multiple TVs. Remember in the, their house. okay, do you remember that famous uh, part of Back to the Future? Yeah. When he goes back in time and he's in the 50s or late 50s and he goes, oh yeah, we have two TVs in the house. And they're like, get out of here. Nobody's got two TVs. No one's that rich. No one's that rich, right? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so the average is 2.5 TVs per household. Yes. Wow. Isn't that wild? Yeah. And 31% yeah. and have four or more. Yeah, so there's foods now that are created around that culture or have been for a long time. So snack foods were big. So think about this. Okay. Imagine if... This was before TVs were invented, right? And so all meals were pretty much around a table with people. How many snack foods would be consumed if that was the case? Right. You'd get up and leave. You'd be like, I don't want to sit here and eat a bag of chips. I'm, I'm done eating. Let me get out of here. Yeah. But if I'm watching this TV show, it's nice to snack on well, something or whatever. Was uh, the microwave, did that come out like simultaneously with the television? Or was that like- 70s. The TV dinner. A little bit later? Because I know that that had a major impact as well in terms of- you know, just being able to heat something up re relatively quickly what was and the, then watch TV. Yeah, I mean, obviously we don't remember from experience, but have you guys seen ads? Like, what? I wonder what the ads look like, Doug, for uh, a microwave. Yeah, microwave. I wonder how they how they pitched yeah, it. Nuclear technology or something. I bet like they. That. I bet it. I bet they te pitched it like you know, supporting the the mom. You know, of like, course. Yeah, supporting oh, the yeah. mom in the house so she doesn't have to spend slave Absolutely. hours and hours in the kitchen or whatever. So I looked this up a long time ago. The there were whole cookbooks. Uh, when the microwave came out around cook Dude. about microwaves, uh -huh. Uh -huh. Oh, wow. so it was like this whole like cook a whole meal with the microwave, and they taught you how to cook a steak in a microwave, and obviously it's gross. Oh, you don't want to do God. that. Dude, it, I've it had that before. You know that you had a microwave. So I, my grandmother, okay, remember when I moved to the Bay Area? Wait, okay? you mean like a raw steak? Yes, yeah, okay. To potatoes, every my grandma only did the microwave. So yeah, well, and TV like dinners. She had the little fold out. Parents. So she's that generation, right? That actually watched the evolution of yeah. TV wow. and set in the microwave. So. When I moved in with her, she was, by the way, she lived by herself for many, many years. Like she, at a very uh, young age, she was divorced. And then basically, and she was a two job, swing shift, crazy work, save mm -hmm. all her money, didn't spend anything on herself. Lived in this little condo, two bedroom apartment in San Jose. Uh, I moved over here to, to when I originally thought I was going to finish my degree in Kines. Moved in with her basically just to like focus and buckle down on school. And this is how I fell into training. Well, she, I mean, I ate with her and so, and I didn't know this until I moved in with her and everything was microwaved and like my, my grandmother made me like Salisbury steak and fucking the microwave. Oh, like, wow, yeah. oh dude, it was so bad, bro. Oh, so bad. I've had eggs, uh, you know, cooked in there and just she, like, oh my God. She would do like canned vegetables that had been in there for like months, pour it in a, in a bowl, put it in the microwave. That was dinner. Oh it yeah. Was, my God. Yeah, bro. It was That's bad. Crazy it was so talk. bad. So you know it's funny. You can look at. You can find. It's still like that. It might you can sense. find. <laughs> oh, is it really, bro? Oh, oh my god, dude! It's pretty bad. Oh, it's pretty bad. So Doug, what are you pulling up here, Doug? 
1925, the first microwave was uh, introduced for domestic use. 1955? 1955. Wow, early, huh? But it became really more prevalent in the 1970s when the price went way down. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And time to nuke dinner. Yeah. And, <laughs> so and, what's going to be like that today, right? That's why I knew it. Nuclear technology. Yeah. I knew they would say some shit like that, right? Hey, hey, so what, what's going to be like that right now that like, you know, only really wealthy people have or have in their house that's like technology that we're probably going to evolve that everybody will have? What do you think that is? Well, right now, I can't. Printers. Yeah, 3D printers will be next. That's a good call. Yeah, that, that's, that's, a, that's was, a good call. But nobody has them yet, uh, except oh, for just maybe. the small ones for like little models. Yeah, I'm talking it. about the legit I'm ones. Big, yeah, yeah. At some point, that'll be that'll be revolutionary. Yeah. Uh, when you have 3D printers in every house, it's going to be really. Anything weird. else you can think of? Hmm. That's like, but but really expensive. Robot that washes the dishes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that's coming. That, that'll it. be probably right after the the moon trips that most of the average people will make. So <laughs> somewhere around there. Uh, <laughs> Shut your mouth. Yeah. You know, back in those days. Okay, so lots of new. A lot of, it's this is cool. If you really want to research the the history of food in America, and I did this only because uh, the 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 correlation between the obesity epidemic it fits perfectly with the consumption of heavily processed foods. But if you look at the food, like the history of America, when these new foods were introduced, like spam and processed foods it was cool and there were entire cookbooks like jello okay jello was this massive thing oh God, jello was huge when it got really popular and there were all these cookbooks and there were the weirdest like like jello tuna casseroles or oh. jello like beef dishes and and these and and they were these cookbooks and people would put them together because it was this new weird food. So let's it's so bring, weird. So bring it to like three D printing. Don't you think that's going to be similar to like how the three D printing evolution is going to be? Like remember you talked about like soon people will be able to print their own shoes and the, yeah. Like mm, it, it's it, interesting to it, think it, about that in a culinary uh, perspective. Well, so think of it like that, right? Everyone's going to adopt it and it's going to be so cool because you could print your own shoes and then we'll see the resurgence of like artists and people that can because it won't ever be able to produce what somebody with their hands can produce. Of course. Well, it's I, I look at it like uh, how um, iTunes was developed because of all these apps and all these different like um, music genres and things and downloads. So obviously you're going to be able to download somebody's creation, like somebody's blueprint, somebody's, you know, something to then just push a button yeah. and then, it'll, you know, they'll, they'll, it'll create a whole they'll, like market. They'll create the market uh, out of it in response to the fact that like, like iTunes was created in response to Napster and dude, all that stuff. Right. Speaking of that. Wait, real Tom, quick. Look at okay, this. Okay. Look at, look up there on there. <laughs> oh, gross okay. dude. Oh, does anybody have a family member that makes oh, like a jello gross. salad? No, no. I remember the shrimp with jello. Like what a horrible combo. Bro, the, it, it, you, it's, it's so, so it's so fascinating if you look at the history of food and processed food in America. Yeah. It is so there were comp, there were entire cookbooks that were taken seriously based off of hot dogs, spam, <laughs> yeah. like weird shit, microwave like entire meal, microwave your turkey for Thanksgiving. Yeah. Like you would find cookbooks on that Dude, kind of stuff. Spaghettios with with hot dog, like there was like this whole recipe behind oh, it. And you're like, what? so weird. All right, Adam. Sorry so I no, I wanted I wanted to look this up. I want to show you guys cuz I read this article uh, and maybe Doug can help me out or Andrew would know. Did you guys hear about the rapper who sold a, a million copies for $1 NFT? Oh, NFT, yeah. Yes. Did you hear about this? I did. Think about how fascinating that he, like, I think it was like in like 30 seconds. Yeah, like, three million he, like bucks. he broke all these Wait, crazy. So, so what he did was he made his song an NFT. Just So this is just one song? Or, a, or is it yeah, his or album? one album. I think okay. it was an album for a dollar. I'll try to see if maybe Doug can get it before me. I think Tori Lannis says he sold 1 million copies of his NFT album in under one minute. What? In under one All minute. because of the NFT hype, though. It's not because of his yeah, music. Yeah, yeah, but think well, about that for a second. Adopter, that's, but. Okay, so if I understand correctly, and maybe Doug can read through it while we're talking about it, is what makes that really cool is if, if you did that, and you're somebody who bought it for $1, and you have that album... And anybody else wants to listen to it, and they want to buy it, for, they'll buy it for yeah, four or five. Yeah, because he's only selling so many. I, that's what I think. I think yeah. there, there's got to be some sort of... Otherwise, what's the point of selling the NFT like that, right? There's got to be some scarcity around it. And think about how smart that is for like an up-and-coming rapper. You have... Like this guy, I guarantee this guy, you guys don't even know who he is, but yet he's got a million people that support him at least, right? Because yeah. he sold a million one dollar. So every transaction of somebody who buys it then goes and passes it on, sells it, he gets a kickback on yes. every one of those transactions. Yeah, it, yes. So technically, he probably didn't sell that many copies. It's just that you know the the no no he did sell a million individual oh, so a million units a mil, yeah a million units for okay. one dollar. But now those people, I believe, can take that and sell it for two dollars, four dollars, five dollars. So he's still getting that in perpetuity. Yes. Yes. Whatever. Yeah. 
Yeah. And, wow. And, and it's smart because basically what you're doing is you're allowing your your cult of people that believe in you and your music and what you're doing and believe, oh, this is the next this is the next Tupac or this is the next big guy. How and I found him for artists to finally get like that's that's most of the money. Okay. That's, okay. Think of all the companies that are going to go. They're going to be gone. Yeah. We talked about this before. Ticketmaster. Yeah. Right, StubHub and Ticketmaster fucked. Fucked because if I want to buy, if I want to get scalp some tickets or buy whatever, now they're gonna love selling their tickets because now they get a piece on every other sale. I didn't know this before, by the way. I thought I didn't understand NFTs, yeah. but now it makes sense. If that I sell one for really ten dollars, and then you buy it for ten bucks, and you want to sell it for twenty bucks, I can attach an automatic commission to that blockchain code or whatever. Mm -hmm. So every time it gets sold, I get ten percent, yeah. and it could get sold a million times. I'll get ten percent. Every single time. Yeah. And it eliminates so many middlemen and so decentralized. What a disrupting and I had no idea. Like I thought NFT like a like all I thought was art. I'm like, who cares? Yeah. Snap take a screenshot and you're done. And it's interesting because like you could actually consume the album and like like it or whatever, but then decide to sell it and even make a profit if it's if it's something that's of value for somebody. Well, yeah. Especially I mean, just like the easiest way I think to think of something like that is like imagine if you were you knew about Tupac before most everybody else did. You were you were the one of the first million, okay, of of the probably tens or hundreds of millions of mm -hmm. people who know who Tupac is and how amazing he was. And you catch him on the way up, and you have the opportunity mm -hmm. to buy one of his first albums and mm -hmm. have it as an NFT, so you own the, the the rights to that one that one, and you have and you could do it for a dollar. And you one, you know, this guy's so hot that I can easily flip and sell this tomorrow for more money, or I can hang on to this, and maybe 10 years from now, when he is the next Tupac, and everyone's like, oh shit, you have one of the, one of one million of well, the- I got some. Don't you think that, that this might just be because it's the very first, because historically, yes. this is the very first- person to do it yeah of course you There's know hype like, i don't know how many people are gonna have that kind of success i just th i just thought of something that's a fair thought it is and i just thought of something very interesting uh you own a collector car a classic collector car right, right. so six you, you don't mind if i say it, right? it's a 68 yeah. camaro super sport great beautiful car it's gonna always gonna go up in value what if you attached to that car an nft let's say you you set it up so that you can't start the car unless you own the nft now how much let's let's just let's say that car right now is valued at seventy thousand dollars on the market and you decide I'm gonna sell it for fifty thousand dollars, except it comes with this NFT, which means I'll get the fifty, but I'll get the ten percent of whatever anybody ever sells in the future. So now you've attached yourself yeah. to that car in the future and you can undercut the the value, the price. Because you're counting on the fact that people are going to buy it. That's how I see it happening. That's and that's crazy. why, even though you guys are saying that, like, okay, the, the novelty, this guy's the first one to do it, but what's to stop somebody who's like Jay-Z, who's who his, his albums are already worth X, and to do it for yeah. so cheap right. that people know on the resale market they could sell. I mean, didn't, Can what, you was it Doug Dr. who looked Dre, at, remember how he was putting his album together, never released it, if he, like, re, like released the unreleased content that he has? Yeah. That would be, be huge. Did you ever find the article? Did you read on it, Doug, at all? Yeah, I mean, I'm not getting a lot of really good information on this, Who but was apparently he sold uh, a, a million of these in less than yeah. one minute. Uh, yeah. And then he did a secondary release, apparently, and sold a bunch more, got sold out. Did he go up in price? or did Well, keep right now, he says the lowest copy right now is going for $30,000. That's so crazy. <laughs> so crazy, man. What? Well, it's yeah. a whole, this is a whole new market that just emerged. It is, but a lot of it's going to get washed out. Well, yeah, I mean, this there's... Is, it's got to it's got to correct itself and become what it's going to be, it's, right? But it, what? It's a gold rush, right? It's like the whole. It's wild how much hype is around. I so I don't know if there's ever been a time in history, at least in my sh short forty years, where I have seen a new technology or a new thing be so heavily marketed and spoken about, like cryptocurrency and NFTs. Yeah, really? Like, you don't think cell phones did that? No. What? No. Bro, we went from no one having cell phones to everyone having cell phones. Yeah, over a period of a decade. Th like, literally overnight, you have seen... Like, tell me if you guys are, like... Okay, just a year ago, okay, of of, of surfing around on YouTube, uh, I you may not have seen hardly any... Now, almost every ad I get is crypto-related or NFT-related. Yeah, I think a like, lot of... Like, I'm inundated with But you know, crypto's been around for mm -hmm. a lot longer than, yeah, than the last year. I, I, I was... So, I belonged to a lot of these uh, kind of free market economic groups. I was introduced to Bitcoin. This is a true story, and it's depressing. I was introduced to Bitcoin 
when it first came out, because it came out to these, to, and, and there was the free market decentralized, like pro libertarian groups that were talking about it early mm -hmm. on. Mm -hmm. I didn't understand it. Okay. I swear I could have bought, and I, it was this close. I was this close <laughs> to buying a thousand dollars with the Bitcoin, which would probably be worth a billion dollars today. And I almost, <laughs> and I didn't do it because it was complicated. And at the time there weren't like, Coinbase didn't exist. So I had to buy like a different thing and have a right. wallet. And I'm like, what is a wallet? What do you mean? It's on the computer. And I didn't do it. And I, I had a client who was like, Sal, you got to buy this. You got to do this. And he was a good friend of mine. I still talked to him. I was like, ah, you know, it doesn't make sense. You know, I don't think I want to do it or whatever. Do you know, oh, my he, God. Do you know if he did it? Do you I'm know? sure he did. Oh, wow. I'm sure he did. But yeah, it was I, all the talk I, about. So, I mean, you're trying to use the, the say that cell phones are like this. Like, I don't remember getting that much information about so everywhere I looked. Like I feel like that's ev everybody's talking about crypto. Yeah. Everybody's talking about NFTs. Everywhere I go on social platforms, YouTube, yeah. anywhere, I at billboards now, commercials on the radio. Like yeah. I don't think I can get a day that I can go by and not every one of those hit me with a yeah. advertisement for crypto or NFT. You know what it is? It's weird. Mm -hmm. Is that uh, the the cycle of new disrupting technologies and how fast they get adopted is getting faster, faster, faster. Yeah. and faster. It's so weird that like the iPhone, how long has the iPhone been around, right? Now you have technology that comes out and it's obsolete in a year. It's yeah. really, really strange. So I mean, I, I get what you're saying. It's yeah. like two years ago, we didn't know what the hell that was. And now all of a sudden, it's everywhere. Yeah, yeah. So people the whole NFT thing is really uh, got hyped up because of Facebook changing the name to Meta. I feel like that was like a big catapult for. Well, I think it NFT definitely it definitely made all of the rush. things that were connected surge because yeah. something something as big and as powerful as Facebook that literally Facebook actually has the resources, and money to go out and go fucking build this virtual world. Right. So when you see a company like that, and then of course everybody following suit, Nike, Adidas, you know, all of them, Disney, all following suit is only driving up the hype even more. It's like holy shit, these are massive established companies. So the now, best. The, what, what did Elon Musk just say about the metaverse? He and said he's it sucks. shit about it, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Let me see if I can find <laughs> yeah, so it. So what was his? So I'm with them on this thing okay. because when when I see like, uh, and does it does that mean that I don't think it's gonna exist? No, I don't think that. I just think that. There is so much hype around this, and there's definitely kids. Okay, I have friends, grown ass men, that spend hours of their time on a pretty regular basis in these virtual games, mm -hmm. and these virtual games have just become more and more interactive. And to me, it's the this is just the next step to that. <laughs> so you it's know, very believable that yeah. there's going to be a large it's just portion, like full on immersion. It's like kind of yeah. like half immersion. Now it's full. on. You know what I like about Elon Musk is he talks like a kid on Reddit, like the way he talks. Like this is what he says. <laughs> Elon Musk says the metaverse sucks. He yeah. says, "Sure, you can put a TV on your nose, but that doesn't put you in the metaverse." <laughs> <laughs> so he's saying, "Oh, this was the interview on uh, the Babylon Bee. I want to, I want to read. I, I do. I, yeah, I've seen we clips of it. But I yeah, seen and he's like, yet. and he says, he says, no, you could put a TV on your nose. It's not the metaverse.' And he says that his because uh, neural link. Yeah, that's why he's talking shit. Because you know he wants to put you on... in there. Yeah, he, he wants to put you inside the metaverse. Like he's literally he's working on the processing power. Well, yeah, of... he's machine and brain together he, he's talking shit because this all you're doing is putting like he said a tv on your nose or creating the uh, the illusion that you're in this place where he's like wanting to link to your brain so you're like you're fucking there you're inside <laughs> yeah, there. Yeah, so you're literally in there come on Elon. i'm cool bro Whoa, Elon. I'm cool. That's, a, that's a big step yeah, yeah. well his his whole argument was always like it's gonna happen so i want to make sure that i do it first and I, do it so that it doesn't well i tell you him. what when he said that when he made that uh, um that metaphor of like that we're already there with the the phone yeah yes it's Be, an appendage already i, I mean that really kind of yeah, know, when right? he said i thought fuck you are so right I know, like right? and and it's just the natural progression to how do we how do we make that faster if it wasn't mm -hmm. like imagine yeah, you when, the type just, just this, distance imagine right when here. you're okay we all we're, we're all we've all been around long enough now that when we were in school like how frustrating it was when you had to go you had to go research something like oh I had God. to go to the library. I had to go look it all up. <laughs> the like I, decimal system. I mean, it was just it was it was a daunting task. Where it's so wild to me that the, this kid, the kids today, like you want to learn something right now, you literally could type that specific thing and get like extreme. Shit, you don't need to type. You just ask Siri or you know. Uh, and so that's Alexa. A great, so that's what you're, you're alluding to right now is my exactly my point. It started off with like holy crap, you could type it in, yeah. and like instantly yeah. that permission. Then it came. Then shortly after, you could just say it. And now soon you'll just have to think it. 
Yeah. Soon you'll just have to that's think it. That's the ultimate step, right? And then it's so that's gonna the, be. So I think that's when we're gonna turn into like a hive mind, and it'll be weird because if we'll we be can able all to read each other's minds, if we can all, which is, I can't imagine how dangerous that's gonna be. I think we're. Do you really want to read everybody's mind? I think we're gonna be a bunch of assholes. Know, scary. Yeah. We're gonna be a fucking self-indulged wieners that think that we're so smart because we do have all the access to the Bro, answer. The like narcissist. We're gonna be. We're gonna be so. We are gonna get killed by. Like our I already narcissism. don't like us. I don't like yeah. us ten years from now. No, no, no. Hey, listen. Just because you know stuff doesn't make you wise. In fact, I think then that the unplugged that- will be out there tripping you. Listen, yeah, listen. You're like, oh, yeah. I know this. Here's my evidence. Here's <laughs> my evidence. Things. Cool. When when I was growing up. There was no community of flat earthers. It did not exist. Oh, it didn't exist. <laughs> they're, they're around today. We have more access to information than ever in human history. Yeah. And there are millions of people. Was it Galileo's day where you had the flat earthers and then he was talking about the yeah, it's, earth being rounded yeah, so and that was radical? It's not like you're wise. So my fear is we're going to connect to this like super internet and with each other and have all the information in the world. And it's going to turn us into narcissistic like it's but like a bunch of teenagers like you know when a teenager finally gets some freedom they do a bunch of stupid stuff because they have no wisdom so they're just like oh yeah that's you know i, I can do that and no well, you can't even my preteen son like I, I call him tweening out all the time because he just like decides to like interject and and, be, and have these like really confident answers and i'm like dude you're <laughs> totally wrong <laughs> where are you coming up with this google it's just like i'm right and then we'll like walk off and i'm like you're so confident and so wrong at the same time yeah dude <laughs> like this was just that's how I, so to that's me. what i feel like it's gonna be you're gonna get these people that if all you have to do is think and you get the google search right away like yeah you're gonna the arguments are gonna be awful to be around you're gonna have people that or just, we'll all think the same like a like a like a hive mind oh. like everybody must go everybody must you yeah. know well, I just like the innocent moments still, though, speaking of, of my kids. Like, I was talking to Everett before putting him to sleep last night, and uh, we were having kind of a funny conversation about Ethan and how, and he's like, I'm convinced he's going through puberty, Dad. Like, <laughs> I'm like, oh, really? Why? He's like, he's like, because he's so lazy and moody. Wait, so Everett says that about Ethan? Or yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh, so he says, that, he, he says, I'll be, when I'm a teenager, I'm going to be lazy like that too, probably. Because of puberty. <laughs> I'm like, oh, no, no, don't set yourself up for that. Bro, that is so like, your youngest is speculating on the older one to have going yeah. to be real. Yeah. That's yeah. hilarious. Yeah, and he's like, he's like, yeah, he's going to get hair. He's going to stink a little bit. I'm like, whoa, wow. I was like, what else do you know about this? You know, I was like curious. I've never talked to him about it, you know. <laughs> Ethan must be like, you know, relaying some information or whatever. But And I was like, what else do you know? And uh, so he's like, thinks about it for a second, and he's like, well – you transition to your ultimate form. <laughs> I was like, <laughs> like the, that's the craziest way of describing hey, that you, I've ever heard. Did you break it to him? Like, uh, no. Yeah, 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 no. Like, it sucks. It's, it's actually a horrible process, but you know, we'll get there. Yeah, it's, it's yeah. way harder. Yeah. Hey, no, you know what's it's an awkward. interesting. You know what's an interesting relationship is. I don't know if you've noticed this, but you have two kids that are relatively close in age and close. So my two older kids are like that, right? But my son, you know, he's 16 now. He's like full, he's like in the teen years. And now there's a little bit of a division between him and his sister. And his sister, she told me that. So the other day they got in a big old argument and they were kind of, you know, brother and sister fight or whatever. And I had to have a talk with my son. And then I brought my daughter down and I talked to her about it. And she just, and I think she didn't, you know, she didn't realize that she was going to tell me her true feelings. And she's like, he's just never around. He doesn't want to hang out with anymore, with me anymore. She's all oh. sad about it. Yeah, and I can, and I'm like, oh, you know, I can see because you know he's 16, like yeah. he doesn't want to hang out with yeah, his. Yeah, yeah, no, you're in high school, you don't want to hang out with your little sister now. Anymore. And all. Yeah, yeah. Like, so you know it's funny. He's okay. gone more often. Yeah. Have you ever heard my sister talk about our relationship in high school? Mm-hmm. It's so funny because so we're we're a year apart, but then we're two years in school. Oh, okay. And this happened to us, and I'm sure she'll tell. She'll, she's going to hear this, and she always calls me out like your your version is so different than my version, mm-hmm. right? But I believe that was a lot of that. I went to high school. We were like inseparable as kids. We played, we did everything together growing up, and we were in the same K through eighth school, so we were always uh, around. But then you went to high school and she was in junior high. That's school. right. We went to high, and then that was for two years. So two years, and I, I wanted my friend. And when she got to high school, she really was attracted to a different group of friends, and I was like the opposite. I was jocks and mm-hmm. athletes and stuff like that, and she was more into like skateboarding kids and like goth and that kind of direction. Like mm-hmm. we were total opposites of our. 
And so we just didn't hang. And then that was like the beginning of our division with each other. And we really didn't come full circle till later on in our, our 20s. Wow. But I'd be, you know, I'm sure if she presented it to you, it would be a little different. But Metal I would brings say. both those together. I, <laughs> oh, yeah, it does, doesn't it? <laughs> yeah. That's, Damn, the, that's Justin, the common link. Yeah. But I, I would say, though, that that probably played a big, the biggest role was yeah. that I has two grades ahead. And then that when you get into high school, that's kind of when you really want to start to like. I separate. remember it with my yeah. younger sister because I was really close with her and, uh, you know, I used to hug her and I loved her all the time. And then I get, you get older and, and it's not that you don't like your sibling. You're just, I'm with my friends and it's a little, you're young, you're too young to hang out with us type of deal. So you kind of split up a little bit. Mm -hmm. She was sad about it. I remember she'd be sad. Can uh, I come? Uh, probably crushes you a little yeah, bit. Yeah. Can I come hang out with you? And I'd be like, I don't mean my buddies are going to do and I don't want my sister around or whatever. Yeah, yeah. And I tried incorporate her sometimes, but I was too protective to have her around some of my dirtbag friends or whatever. Yeah. So I saw that. So my daughter said that and I was like, oh, I choked up a little bit. Like, oh, you know, my poor, my little girl, she's losing her, oh, yeah. her best friend, a different you know? stage, you know? Oh. Yeah. But do you see that now? Are, are, is that happening yet? A little bit. Yeah, yeah. I mean, they're, they're definitely, they have their own set of friends. And mm -hmm. so they, they kind of have different things that we have to figure out, like a, like a division of time. Like if, if, you know, one of them gets to go uh, and stay with their friends or which one has to stay home. And then we try to figure out what to do with that's fun for the, the one that stays home. And, mm. you know, so it is a little bit more like a split uh, in terms of like how we're trying to manage, like and you're Jordan? not even you're not even there yet because when Ethan hits high school is when yeah, it's, it's, that's yeah. when it's going to leave him in the dust. He's got though. a couple more years, yeah, and then you'll start to. They're still buds and they hang out, but yeah, it's it's starting. Yeah, you know, you know, one of the ways you could separate generations. I I learned this. I mean, we might have talked about this a long time ago, but there's a, a very clear way you can tell if somebody was born in the cell phone generation or the like the phone generation that we grew up with. So ask a kid. You might want to try this with your sons. Say, hey, pretend like you're talking on your phone. Oh, the way they do this? No, they go they, like this. Yeah, yeah, they do yeah. this. This is how they talk on the phone, we, whereas we, we, do, we this. do this. Yeah. Because we grew up with phones when they had a, a you know a receiver and a speaker and a yeah, cord. Doug goes like this. <laughs> 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 Doug, 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 no. Does, no, Doug does this. <laughs> <laughs> I say, operator? It's operator. Yeah, pretend like you're on the phone. <laughs> 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 he goes like this. Morse code. Yeah, ding, 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 ding. There's smoke signals. Yeah. Uh, Let's take it all the way back. <laughs> what are you wearing? <laughs> Did you have something about carrier pigeons? That you're oh my bring God. Up? You just reminded me. Yeah. What they happened? Just, bro, I got to pull this up. So, drug smugglers are crazy with the shit that they do to get their drugs across borders. <laughs> Shut up. They're using pigeons now. Bro, carrier pigeon. They found a carrier pigeon they, they, with a little backpack, had 178 ketamine pills in it. <laughs> What? <laughs> yeah. So that that's in wow. a that's in a movie. That's I've seen that in a movie before where they because they because I can't remember, but they could actually carry quite a bit of weight, and you could train them to fly to certain places. And well, fly carrier back. pigeons were used. Isn't that in John Wick? Yeah, that's and they were used in I war. I don't know what movie it's yeah. in. I you know, know that too. You know that right? In war, carrier pigeons were used quite a bit before electronic technology. They would communicate with each other with carrier pigeons, and so there were literally soldiers who were dedicated, and they had hawks that were dedicated to taking down. Pigeons that were flying steal across. Steal those messages, yeah. Yeah, to steal those messages and see what's uh, going on. I saw another one where they were op they were literally, they looked like, not like two by fours, but they were slats of wood. And they looked like wood. Like there was, and the, the, the DEA agents were showing how they were smuggling drugs and they crack one open, open the wood, and there's freaking drugs. In the wood? In the wood. The planks? The wood. Yes, dude. Wow. Crazy how they come Super up with creative. How they that's, come up with some of this shit. It's like up and smoke that's wild. that van where like every panel and everything was just oh. stuff. Well, refrigerators were popular and computers were popular, right? So you take a why because you, you, you could take like a like a you could do it depending on how much you're doing a, a mini fridge or a big fridge and you take the insert of the this is what I hear. You take the insert. <laughs> <laughs> so I've been told. My friends told me this, right? <laughs> so you take you take the, the inserts out on and behind there is like all this like foam stuff for the to keep the the temperature. Uh -huh. Yeah. You pull all that out and you can put a, a lot of stuff in there. <laughs> How <laughs> much? <laughs> a, lot, a lot of stuff I hear. Like in that and then also like um, we don't have any t computer towers, but computer towers are pretty big. Yeah, yeah. And mm. you normally fill them up with all the I don't know what the hell you call the 
I don't know. What do you what's called, Doug? What do you call, what do you call the things? I don't know, the kilo bags? No, 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 no. Not the drugs. <laughs> Sorry. Oh, I don't need the drug oh, reference the, from the you. Hard I need the, drives. the hard drives. Yeah, Thank yeah. you. He knows the drugs. He's like, yeah, he's like, I'm, I'm trying to help like out guessing here. drugs, cocaine out of them, heroin? Yeah. No, See, no. this brings me back to my original theory with uh, Outdoor World and like uh, Bass Pro Shops. and you know. Why like, do you think I'm right with you on that? Yeah. I'm like, dude, they they have such big things like a you know, big bass things. boat. You know, like kilos of cocaine you can buy. Come on, dude. In a bass Outdoor boat. World's not selling drugs. Stop it. I don't know, dude. It's going to come out someday. You know, I actually, we didn't get anybody who normally always when we speculate on weird shit like that, I get like at least a handful of DMs of somebody who has like, it, intimate knowledge of that and I we didn't get anything about nothing. that and I'm still like... There are some businesses that just I don't make sense. I my head, dude. Okay, you know what doesn't make sense to me? More than that. Way more than that. You ever go to like a nice area and you see these little stores that sell like candles. Well, yeah, okay. So you and bullshit now and, my and crystals and I'm like, I you pay. I know what the rent in Los Gatos is. I had a business here. So I have. How a, can you survive? The, I have a theory on that. Okay, you have a. You think she's bored? There's a board. No, I think I think you have a spouse, city council, who makes wife. Yes. four or five million dollars a year, and he can use every write off possible, and so he gives a sh and it keeps her busy and happy, or him. Okay, if, if it's the rich woman and then the, the husband's deciding to open a candle shop, even though you don't see a lot of that, but maybe. Okay, so I'm being yeah. non-sexist yeah, here. That, yep. Okay, so they open up this store Man and they don't care if that fucking thing loses. It doesn't even matter. <laughs> Gets to have their little boutique store downtown <laughs> and do you business. Imagine, you imagine being like such a like such a dick, right? You come home and you're like, honey, you know, I know it's Christmas. I just want you to know, I know your dream. You love, <laughs> you love making candles. Yeah. So I just, I got you a store. Dude, Main sure. Street on Main Street, babe. Come on, dude. Don't you're, worry about it. Oh, I'm not going to make any One of these Listen. rich tech guys, dude, of course. Like, that's probably something they consider. Maybe. Like, oh. That's got to be it because there's a bunch yeah. of them. You go in. And they, I mean, that's they she's really into decorations. They sell here, crystals, honey. candles, and, and, and cards. And I know that. I mean, the ones that yeah. last, that's my theory. Because uh, you, you do see that also, and then next year it's a whole other store. So yeah. sometimes it's somebody who's really ambitious, thinks it's a good idea yeah. to rent for $10,000 a month in mm -hmm. Los Gatos. And it's, you know, their business makes a total of $10,000 in the year. And, yeah. they, and then they are, they're out after their lease. But if it's someone who stays in there for years and years, yeah, I would speculate that they've... Either that or they did a real, which today you might see, and I'm sure there's somebody out there that has done this. You built a, a very solid, you know, direct to consumer brand, and then you built a storefront like a, like a, oh, to okay. complement it. So you don't care that maybe you only made four grand in the store this this month and your rent's 10000 That's okay. You made 30000 online. I see. So it's yeah. like a showroom. Right. I see. You know, did I ever tell you guys about the time I, I uh, my buddies bet me to go into a psych? There was a psychic place on one of those main streets. Oh, you did. You went in? Yeah. And they go, go in. And, I, and so I, I went in and it's totally a dick. I was such a stupid kid. I went in there and the, the lady's like, oh, you know. How can I help you? And I'm like, you tell me. <laughs> she's like, you knew all the answers. Yeah, and she's like, well, what's your name? I'm like, I don't know. What do you think? And I was such a dick, you know. I was like, get out. That's not how it works, you know. <laughs> Is that all that happened? You got to give yeah, me something. Oh wow, you couldn't even get wow. a reading, huh? No, no, like, that's not how it works. You need to get out. You know. Like, all right, I'll, <laughs> I'll, I'll see you later. You need to give me enough information so I, I can I'm look up your MySpace. A lot of them have like a Google, like underneath the table, that they're just like you know fishing well, for little things. That as being you go. that being said, dude, I had a really weird experience with a. I had a client once that I trained and she was a very she was super smart like high performing executive badass woman and so I can like everything she said I took seriously right I trained her she's super fit whatever and for I don't remember what it for my birthday or something like that she bought me like a free session with this woman who yeah, did this yeah mm. and it was my client and as a friend and I'm like you know guys know me I'm super skeptical of stuff this is especially back then when I was even more skeptical than I am now and so I said, all right, I'll, I'll take it or whatever. Anyway, this lady said the weirdest shit to me, like stuff that I was like, I don't know how you know that or what you're, I, yeah. I, I'm not, I wasn't, I wasn't, this is when I owned my Every now studio. and then I've heard sometimes they get it like dead on. Dude, my cousin, his wife, she had just broke, I think she had just broken up with some guy or whatever. And she, her friends took her to one for fun. And she said to her, you're going to go out, uh, I don't remember, in this month, you're going to go to a club. And she's like, I never go to clubs, but whatever. And you're going to meet your husband your future husband. She's like, whatever. She forgets all about it. That month comes up. Her friends drag her to the club. She's like, go to the club. She runs into, now my cousin who she's married to, and she runs into him and she flirts with him and they're married and they have kids and everything. And then she remembered and she tells the story all the time. Super weird. Yeah. yeah. That is super, weird. super weird. I, I went out with a girl one time who actually, uh, she recorded her session and what was weird about it was like she didn't present this to me until like the second or the third time that we had gone out. 
and she let me listen to it and the fucking like medium or whatever you call them or with psychic literally like like was talking about me and describing me like to what I did for a living <laughs> what so I watch my, out for this guy. Gonna dump my you. feature <laughs> my, my features was like, was how you how team. she was going to meet me all this stuff was fucking weird dude <laughs> Like I felt, that, I felt like man, I need to go out at least another time with this chick. You know what I'm yeah. saying? But I, de- it was really, really. Now, weird. what if? Just what if? Yeah, because you're obviously not with this girl anymore. Right, right. Okay. What if this girl was like super psycho? She meets you, and then she's like, "Let's record this shit." So I'm kind of convinced guy. that now, like mm, later on, yeah. right? Look, so she has a friend. I look back, I'm like, she was probably one of those crazy chicks that like yeah. you know, manufactured this. Yeah, she's like, "How many already met me and everything like that?" And they're like, "Hey, you need to do this for me because like, totally could have bamboozled me. Really I had no him. idea." Yeah. yeah. Say, so how am I going to bag this guy? And at the end of the tape, it's like, and he will get you pregnant, and then your son will be the leader of the world. Like, Damn. <laughs> <laughs> I guess I got to do this. He's going to resist at first, but persevere. Yeah. That's right. <laughs> and you'll get so rich because of it. Like, all right, all right, I'll do it. It was wild, dude. It was definitely, but you know what? Later on, I thought, I think because she did seem a little off. I yeah. thought, oh, you know what? Maybe she had her friend do that. It was a little I crazy. hope she's listening right now. I'd hey. say that was probably, I'd tell you what, though, for for any other crazy chicks looking for strategies, that was a pretty good strategy. Yeah. That, it's pretty it's pretty unique. You know what I'm yeah. saying? <laughs> That's the first time that so ever happened a, to me. Yeah, it's an interesting angle. <laughs> I had a, I had a girl, this was a terrible story. I had a girl once, this was a year, I was a kid. I was uh, 18 and I dated this girl for like a short period of time. And then I broke up with her and she said, she tells me that, uh, oh, you know, I, I got, I, I got pregnant. This is after we broke up. So I'm like, oh my God, are you kidding me? Like, I'm stressed out. I'm 18 years old. She's like, don't worry. I'm going to go, you know, go to the clinic or whatever. And I'm like, I already have the date scheduled. It's on this day. And I'm like freaking out. Like, oh my God, what am I going to do? Mm-hmm. And then I looked at the day that she gave me. She you know, blow jobs get people pregnant. <laughs> <laughs> we just held hands. <laughs> Shut up. No. <laughs> no, we had standard intercourse. <laughs> <laughs> she, hey, I don't make it out because you're so pregnant. Yeah, hey, <laughs> she, she fucked up. She wasn't careful. So she tells me the date and the place, and it happened to be on a holiday. And so I, and I called her on. I'm like, I don't. They're not open on that day. Let me go with you. And then she gave up. She told me that she made it all up. I was like, oh my you oh, wow. snake, dude. total wow. snake, yeah. lied about the whole thing. Yeah, that's a dirty move. I mean, I was a kid. I was 18 years old. Yeah, dude. Yes. Can you believe that? That's a professional move she just played on. Yeah. Hey, guys. speaking of crazy stuff, you guys want to see the latest ju- the latest like trend in jiu-jitsu? No, what's that? Doug, pull up uh, the, the link that I gave you. Car jitsu. Okay, Wait, so <laughs> that's a type of jiu-jitsu? Yeah, dude. Okay. Now no. cars are getting into it? What's happening? No, dude? it's it's really cool. So- Two jujitsu guys. I watched one of these videos. I thought it was hilarious. They're sitting like teaching you how to like in case someone attacks you. No, in the it's a tournament. They oh, actually shut have, up. It's like a real thing. It's a tournament. Oh, Doug, they're doing it inside the, the car. Doug, is there a video we can watch? What Bro, the is this really oh, there a thing? You go. So you have to sit in the, <laughs> Can so you use a seatbelt? So this you, no, no. Is, so let, play this. I want to see this. this is so you sit funny. in the oh car. God, that's hilarious. And you both put your seatbelt on. And then when the turn when the fight starts, you, you take the seatbelt off and you go at it in the car. <laughs> Bro, this is Who the hilarious. Hell came up with this, Who dude? thought of this? I don't. Oh, this I don't is know. Pull, yeah, full but screen. But I've seen a couple videos. You gotta watch this. This was a whole tournament. And these are two black belts. Like, check it out. So, oh, oh my god. Seatbelt off, and oh, they go out. He's <laughs> off in time, dude. <laughs> yeah, dude. Oh, bro. And you have to fight in the car, and submit each other. Tell me, this isn't brilliant? Like, how though? Like, I know you guys would never watch a jujitsu tournament, but I bet you no, guys want to watch this. this. Yeah, that is hilarious. Isn't that great? I feel like this would be a good car commercial too. Yeah. I bet there's like, I bet there has to be like Next a, move is the uh, hot box. there's gotta be history behind this, right? Or there's gotta be a reason why it evolved or happened. And it makes sense, right? Like to people get carjacked and like, imagine if someone gets in your car and like yeah. how to defend yourself from in this situation. I mean, I guess I just think it's entertaining. I mean, why I'm else? Of all the most random things space. to like, let's do jujitsu. Let's, let's do it in our cars. Yeah. I think it's hilarious. So jujitsu is interesting because there's, there's a lot of uh, like stoner, Influence in jujitsu, uh-huh. yeah. So I feel this like is totally a stoner idea. I feel like this was a stoner idea, big time. Like, oh, hey, yeah. what if we, what if we went Wouldn't at it? Be great. <laughs> <laughs> this, I would totally watch that. Right? The buddies sit around seat. all high. Like, yeah, yeah, I would totally watch. There was that. a tournament a while ago. Eddie Bravo put it together where they smoked weed before the match. So oh, they that's they would great. they would smoke the weed. Like, I think that would help. It relax you a little bit. You know what's funny? So this is why it's such a big deal, a big thing in jujitsu. The classic, like the old school jujitsu people are like, like the Gracie family. They're so against it, right? It's drugs, mm. it's not good for you. Then there's a new school where jujitsu is kind of like got a surf culture where they smoke weed and they, they create new moves. And some of them say it helps with their creativity. Right. 
So they did this whole tournament where they would smoke weed and then roll. And I've talked to, so I never done, I never did this. When I did jujitsu, I never did that. But I have talked to guys and they say that, oh yeah, it's great. You, 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 you smoke weed and then you get, you like, you're better with your creativity and your flow yeah. on the ground. I mean, I feel like it's one of those sports where, you know, kind of being like, it's probably, probably one of the biggest mistakes. I'm assuming I have no idea. I've never done jujitsu, but I would think like a guy like me who doesn't know better, like probably the number one mistake I would probably make and most people like me would make is I would try and use my strength. Yeah, yeah. Tense I, up I, I would, yeah, I would tense up and I would try and like muscle everything where yeah. that's one of those sports of you're using their force and counter and so kind of relaxing in, in, a, in a very tense, well, I guess, situation. There's got to be like a threshold to that though too. If you go too much weed, right, and you get paranoid <laughs> there's and always you're getting too much. choked out, <laughs> that sounds horrible. Or so if you guys have never done it before or grappled that way, like if there's a like a big like you're a big dude justin so if you go in a tournament you're going against a guy that's your size so. yeah and you got a big guy who's you know holding you down in side mount or north south so north south is literally There's a lot of physicality there. north south like this right so yeah. his head is facing your crotch your head's facing 69 his crotch. is it's what not, we call it, it oh. yeah okay kind of like that but anyway it's not that but his I'm gonna tell it true to that. Hey, dude. hey, you want to do some north south? Let's do some north south uh, maneuver. <laughs> Let's see your chest out first. Yeah. Yeah. And and so his like his chest and like his belly will be like pressing on your face, bro. Oh my god! So you would be you so can't paranoid. You just, oh. oh, it's the worst. Yeah, dude. dude. Again, yeah. There's a, there's a, like kind of like that balance of being relaxed, but I could get paranoid pretty quickly. Yeah. Hey, you gotta go check out Live On Labs. They make supplements, right? Vitamins and minerals that your body actually absorbs. They actually use a technology that was created by and for pharmaceutical companies. Now, one of my favorite products from Live On is their glutathione. Glutathione, when you take it orally, normally doesn't get absorbed very well, but if you get it through their way of delivery, through liposomal technology, it actually raises glutathione levels in your body. So it's great for the immune system. It really helps with any respiratory illness. It helps improve the pump recovery. And by the way, they have other supplements and vitamins and minerals as well. So you got to go check them out. Head over to liveonlabs.com. That's L-I-V-O-N-L-A-B-S.com forward slash mind pump. And if you buy any product on there, you'll get a sample pack of all six of their other supplements for free. All right, here comes the rest of the show. Our first caller is Lauren from New Jersey. Lauren, how's it going? How Hi, can we Lauren. help you? Hey guys, how are you? Good. What's happening? Yeah. Good. What what an honor it is uh, to be here with you today. This is uh, totally inspiring for me. Oh, thank you. All right. So I kind of have two a two part question. Um, first part is I'm actually just finishing up Maps Split. Um, by the way, I loved it. I totally appreciate um, the effort you guys put in sequencing the exercise. I had done splits before. Um, I had never done anything like this that had such, um, you know, precise phasing. Um, I love the process of it too. So that was awesome. And, you know, following through with the step counts in each phase and then getting progressively bigger each time. Uh, I'm not going to lie, toward the end, um, it was a real challenge to complete it, but I'm proud to say that I completed every workout. Um, I hit every step count and um, I'm feeling really good. I'm just wondering where to go from here. So that I, I am someone who normally works out seven days a week. I have a tendency to overtrain and overdo it. But after doing your program, it was the most comprehensive program I've ever done. Um, I'm just not sure where to go from here. Certainly, um, I upped my activity level with it um, toward the end. And I know that for me, that that's not going to be sustainable long term. And I had really good progress with strength gains. So I'm kind of wondering, um, where do I go from here? I've heard you guys always preach that less is more, you know, training the three days a week full body. I feel like that would be a lot less than what I'm coming from. And I'm just kind of concerned about losing strength and losing progress. Okay, Lauren. Now, in your in your question that you sent in, you also said you're a recovering cardio addict and you admittedly have a tendency to overtrain, which I would have guessed because the first program that you picked from us was MAP Split. <laughs> yeah, I would have put volume you on volume high. I would have yeah, put you on anabolic first. Yeah, that's one of our highest volume, like kind of bodybuilder style workout programs. 
So, do you want the advice that's the best for you, or do you want the advice that you, you want to hear? I I know. <laughs> <laughs> um, I I really I think I really need some tough love from you um, to hear what you know to hear what what I need. Okay. Um, you know to kind of move forward. All right, all right. Here's some tough love. Okay, if you're gonna do what I tell you, okay, if you're gonna do exactly what I tell you, I want you to do maps maps performance. You've done map split. Oh. It's time to move into a program that trains different planes of movement, that works on mobility. Don't worry. You're going to still get strong. You're still going to build muscle. Here's the best part. You can do MAPS performance six or seven days a week. So three days a week are the resistance training days. The other days are mobility sessions. And if you like movement and, and athleticism, um, you'll love the mobility sessions. They're still somewhat of a workout. It's much less intense, but they're going to improve your mobility and your ability to just connect to different movement. And they're going to help facilitate recovery. I think that's going to be the best next step because you just, you're, I mean, map split is literally, I mean, one of our most advanced bodybuilder volume based workout programs. So I'm not going to put you in another program that's similar. Maps on a would be great too. But I think because you just did split, I think performance is going to benefit your body so much. Um, and if you trust what I'm saying and you just do it and don't judge the process, but trust the process, you will be very, very happy with the results you get from that program. I'd like to. I would have liked to have seen her do anabolic then performance, but I'll, I'll. I can. I can concede to performance. I mean, I think. I think performance is going to tremendously benefit her. But I think what would be best for her her body, her personality type, and the, the things that she tends to do would be to get her out of that. Uh, you could make the argument that it, it's uh, going to be uh, very difficult uh, for her men uh, mentally to make that shift. Mm -hmm. But personally, I would love to see anabolic, then performance, then aesthetic, and then work your way back to a strong or a split type of a routine. That would yeah. I, I I agree. I do like that that suggestion. Um, I think that that's probably the best, but it will be mentally difficult uh, again to to make that dramatic shift because you're going to be learning a lot of moves and things that probably you're not very familiar with. So you know, stick with it and and stick to the program and plan as as much as possible and trust it. Uh, it's going to be outside your comfort zone for sure. And it, not that it's not going to be fun. It's just, you know, look at it as a totally new thing that you're you're there to kind of educate your body and, and go through the process. Yeah, and the volume and mass performance is really appropriate. It's not a super ridiculous high volume program. The but it's not super session, low either, though. It isn't, but the mobility sessions are good. And you know what? Well, your body's just well, going to feel I, Well, so I forgot better. to add this, too, because Lauren wrote in her question, and I, I read your question you didn't just go into map split from beginner. You were doing Mike Matthews, uh, you know, split routine before you went into that, right? Yeah. So I, I fr kind of first got into, you know, I first started kind of seeing the light of resistance training um, and started doing far less cardio a couple of years ago. And I found Mike Matthews thinner, leaner, stronger. I was doing his five day split program, which was great. And knowing my personality, I turned it into a seven day program. Yeah. And then at a certain point, I just frankly got a little bored and I and I stopped seeing progress and I was a little frustrated. So that's when I found Max. Yeah. yeah and, 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 and with with his pro, because I know his program very well. Mike's a good friend of ours. Great guy. Um, really smart guy. And his program places a heavy emphasis on you know, bench presses and rows and overhead presses. So that's why you went to perform. Yeah, and then he's, and then she went to split, which is bodybuilding, so but it's also very sad. So I playing. see where you're going with yeah. that. Okay, I, get, I see where you're going. That, that takes it because you're. Oh, she's going to see a lot of. She's going to see some significant progress because of that. Where maybe she'd see a little less progress going mm -hmm. to anabolic yes. because it's similar enough, even though it's different. Totally new stimulus. Um, but okay. That being said, then this is what I would love to see. Then I would love to see performance right now. Then to anabolic, yeah. and then when you go into anabolic, I would actually uh, use the mobo mobility sessions from performance and add them to my trigger days. Yeah, that's so great. if you like if you like the you know six day seven day routine and uh, you and you want to do more, I, I think you you can do more, just more of the right things for your body that you'll get the most bang for your buck. And what that would look like for someone like you, in my opinion, would be 
the mobility sessions from performance, and you can go ahead and, and add those into anabolic when you go into that. So I go performance and then anabolic with a, a like little, little combination of the mobility. Yeah, and, and here's why you're lucky, Lauren, because we recommended two programs. So now we're going to give you two programs for free. But I, you know what? I think we're I think we're underestimating how much she's going to enjoy performance because she did marathons and triathlons. Is that correct? She's going to love the lunge matrix. Yeah, I I love the process, and um, I'll, I'll tell you this: I already have those programs. Oh. Um, I kind of went crazy <laughs> yeah. during your Black Friday stuff. So. Oh, well, <laughs> there you go. Um, All right. Are you in the private forum? Because I, I would love to I'm follow not, up. I'm not in the private forum. Okay. Um, We'll do that. Let's put you in the forum for free. I just want to follow up on your progress. I think actually, because I know you did triathlons, marathons, you like functional movement, you like the sport aspect or that that aspect of training, probably. You're gonna love MAPS performance. It's gonna be a lot of fun training in that way. And then once you see how your body responds, that's it. I think you're gonna be sold on training your body appropriately. So let's do that. Let's put you in the forum, tag us, let us know what's going on. Adam gave great advice. MAPS performance to MAPS uh, anabolic, using the mobility sessions throughout both of them. I think that's great. Thank you. That's that's awesome. And, and I just want to reiterate again, you know, I, I work in the fitness industry. I'm a, a GM of a fitness and wellness center. You guys have inspired me so much. Um, mainly, you've really opened my eyes to a lot of the mobility stuff. Um, I, I have Prime and I've you know, brought those skills um, into the programming here by encouraging the staff to add more mobility, more functional movement, especially into our group exercise program. We have a big population of active seniors here and they're just loving it. Um, I think the stuff that you guys say about making people feel good um, keeps them coming back. And I, th I think that's what it's all about. So I just really appreciate you know your knowledge your sharing of information and just the, the inspiration you guys give oh. every day i have a two-hour commute each way to work and um you're with me every every time awesome. oh that's awesome you know what Thank lauren you. now that i know that you you are you know, manage a, a fitness department i want you to start to treat yourself and train yourself like one of your clients because i guarantee if one of your clients came in and literally said exactly what you said to me on this podcast, your advice would be very similar to mine. Am I, am I wrong or am I right? It's so true. Um, you know, it's some, you know, I, I fall into the camp, uh, you know, adherence is never my problem. I'm, I'm like, you know, all or nothing, yeah. you know, kind of personality. And I, I tend to overtrain and push myself. I would never tell a client that. Of right. course, we, we always train our <laughs> yep. clients better than ourselves. So try and put yourself in those shoes and you're more likely to give yourself better advice. Thanks for calling. Thank you, Lauren. Yeah. Thank you so much. Appreciate it. No problem. People don't realize that the vast majority of people in the fitness industry have somewhat of a dysfunctional relationship when it comes to exercise. They do a great job with their clients, mm -hmm. and they would give great advice to the clients. But and by the way, this so is, many trainers and coaches fall into that this trap. applies to me. Yeah. Okay, this I'm I'm talking to me. Each as one well. of us here. Let's be honest. Yeah, yeah I, I, it's it's so hard. But I've had to do that myself. Like, what would I tell my client to do? Like, oh, it's not what I'm doing now. So it's really, really challenging when you're in that position. So I know what, I know what she's going to What is through, that but. paradox that causes that, Doug? That's like, uh, you see that even like with, with therapists and people, a lot of times Doctors people are, too. yeah, they're, they're talking to themselves, Yeah. right? We, it's like the, the, they're, they're preaching this message and they're really communicating their own stuff. Oh yeah. You know? Doctors and nurses are the worst patients. I yeah. think a lot of professions are like yeah. that. You, you know, see, you see that all, even in like people that are like inspirational speakers and stuff like that, then they're all depressed at home and yeah. shit. You, you know, know what, what it is? Right. I think what it is, is. The you know if I if I'm talking if someone's helping me with let's say a, a disordered eating, the person who struggles with it, who makes this their passion and that's their expertise, probably will understand how to communicate to me the best and do the best job. I really I really believe that. So I think that's probably part of it. You know, like I, I, I know how to talk to people with this kind of relationship with exercise because. I live it. You know I think I mean? more of it is you're working your own s shit out. I think subconsciously you know maybe what you're yeah. supposed to be yeah. doing for yourself, so you're you're comfortable with saying it. You're relaying it. Yeah, but you're not internalizing. Right, it. exactly. Yeah. But then you still struggle yeah. with taking your own advice sure. about it. But you, but subconsciously you know better because you either have, have read or you've learned over time, and so you do better with communicating it to others. But then taking your own advice is one of the hardest things to do. Our next caller is Justin from Tennessee. Justin, what's happening, man? How can we help you? Hey, how are you guys? Thanks for having me. Uh, just had a real quick question. Um, I was listening to your recent podcast regarding how to maximize your 30-minute workout. Uh, I've been doing Go Ruck 
events since 2019. And these events are some of the most difficult uh, endurance events out there. Some of these events, 12 to 14 hours in duration. Uh, additionally, there's plenty of PT and miles while carrying a various amounts of weight. So I have a kind of a two-part question. Uh, one, in your opinion, could I still get the fitness level that I, I kind of need with the 30-minute time frame workout and still perform well? And I guess really my main question is, uh, if you guys were going to train for one of these events, how would you approach it? Oh, Ooh, man. Man, 30 okay, minutes 30 training minutes is, and then your goal is these oof. these events? Yeah, that's tough. So you can get, I mean, you can get pretty far, Yeah, but I'm going to be honest with you, Justin. You know what? You'll get really good at the first 30 minutes of that. Uh, yeah. <laughs> you'll crush that <laughs> yeah, opener. Yeah, crush yeah it. it's, it, it, it's going to be really tough because it's so different. Like what you need is a, endurance. a specific type of endurance, you know, 12 hours 24 hours build up that work capacity uh, yeah where you're just moving and and i would look here's how i would train for that i would do the occasional long ruck uh as part of my training and then i would do a little bit of strength training and i do mobility work and I, but but i would definitely at least once a week i would do a long hike that would be a few hours and then maybe once a month a really long one to cut because you have to nothing's going to get you as prepared for what you're doing like training like the competition itself. Well, what do you guys think about him using like the work sessions in strong for his strike training type of routine and then doing what you're doing saying rock, is yeah. once a week or once every other week he does like a long old, you know, ruck type of a run, like the combination. Yeah, I mean, that sounds good. Yeah, I, mean, I it's was about considering the, the same thing. I feel like that's the, the direction I would go. If I'm limited to my, my time of lifting during the week, I only got 30 minutes, I'd probably lean you towards the work sessions that we have, especially since a lot of it has to do with like carrying yeah. and stuff like that. Stuff well, that will maybe benefit. even then one or two of the actual like foundational workouts from strong, you know, during the week and then adding in just the work sessions were the main focus and then having that, yeah, I yeah. think I think that would all be valuable. Yeah, Ju Justin, do you have, uh, would you be able to schedule like two long hikes a month or is that not, does that not work as well? Yeah, 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 I can, I can definitely do that. I've, I've done uh, multiple 12 mile go ruck events and I've, I've done 150 miler. And um, so, yeah, yeah, I can get, I've got several days where I can put in some a lot of miles. Yeah, I think if you did a couple a month, that would make a dent. That would definitely make a dent and, and improve your ability to do the competition. And then the rest of the workouts, you know, you could you could do the work sessions from Map Strong or the foundational workouts for Map Strong. Well, now that I know that we're working with that, okay, so that also changes my advice a little bit. So if if I could get you to commit to me to to four days, you know, so maybe they're a weekend day. Or this is going to be kind of our endurance training. We're together. I'd have a a day where so let's say I know I'm getting ready for an event. Say whatever the distance is, 25 mile, 50 mile, 10 mile, whatever you know the distance is. I would then do uh, four 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 times four times in a month, so one time a week. And one time I would go quarter the distance. One time I'd go half the distance. One time I'd go three quarters distance. One time I go full distance on what the main goal is. Does that make sense? So like if we were training for a go ruck event that. The, the, the miles is 25 miles. I'd have one day a week where I'm doing a quarter of that. One day a week, I'm doing half of that. W one day out of the week where I'm doing uh, the three quarters and then one. One in one, one whole week or you no, mean in a, a month? month. In a uh, month. One week, one week, one week. I yes. Get yeah. You get what I'm like saying? That. I like that. So he's only one time a month. Is he even doing anything close yeah, to I like the, that. the full distance? Mm -hmm. The other time he's doing three quarters. The other time he's doing a half. The other time he's doing a quarter of it. And then his training during the week looks like strong work sessions. Now, can you describe, I mean, at least for the audience too, and I have somewhat of a semblance of what rucking is or entails, but uh, can you describe a little bit more about that? Like what kind of like backpack and what kind of weight load you're carrying around? Yeah. So uh, typically, you know, I, I, the pack that I use is from Go Ruck. I have a, um, a 3.0 is, I guess, the name of that specific bag, but a backpack type of bag and then they've got sections in there where you can put weight in there. So you're carrying, you know, uh, and there's kind of two different sections of, of events. Like you have one that you're just doing a lot of miles with your select team. And then you're doing, uh, they have other ones where you're doing it as a large group, but it's over, you know, um, you don't really know what you're going to be doing, but it could be over 12 to 48 hours, depending on which one you want to do. How much but, weights in the, in the bag? Yeah, yeah. So you'll have uh, in your bag, you're going to be carrying anywhere from probably 20 to 40 pounds plus whatever else they bring for you to carry around. So hmm. you can carry um, you know, that amount of weight up to, you know, 
120, 40, 60 pounds, depending, not the whole time, but you're going to be sharing that load with other people. Okay. So, so you actually share it with a, do you also, are you able to load it in the front too, or is this always loaded in your back? Yeah. As long as you just carry it, I don't think they really mind how you do okay. it. You know? So uh, sometimes, I mean, some people are carrying it, sharing it just by carrying it in their hands. Um, you know, they put it on top of their, their, their ruck bags. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, depending on what the object is, you have to carry if it's a telephone pole or if it's a, you know, a large sandbag or uh, another person, you know, um, so. Yeah, just uh, considering that all those different types of loading, I would I would, you know, definitely try and emulate that as much as possible, especially sandbags and, uh, you know, front loaded carries versus, you know, back loaded carries and incorporate that within your training, too. Yeah. No, yeah, I think what the advice Adam gave was a great one. I mean, you don't have to do long, you know, endurance type training often to gain the benefit. I think the advice he gave was great. And then the majority of training is around mobility, strength. You can do some high intensity interval training, continue to build, you know, some of that stamina. Um, and I think that should be that should be okay. Yeah, yeah, because so kind of what I'm doing now is besides getting my miles in, Bill Rook also has like a, an SRT program, kind of like a sandbag work training program where you're doing five workouts a week uh, where you're you're working out with uh, your ruck bag and your and sandbags for whatever you have. And so they have different workouts for you to do to kind of help prepare you for that. Yeah. So, so let me interrupt you there. That, that's cool. Okay, but I don't know what this program looks like, so I'm going to be just you know kind of speaking out of my butt here. But oftentimes, when they when these organizations create these workout programs, they overdo it. And what I mean by they overdo it, like okay, yes, it's important to train with your bag, but if you want to gain strength from a lift, you're better off with a dumbbell or a barbell. That doesn't mean you eliminate the bag. You want to work with the bag with some of your training, but some people go too far, and it's like all you know, all the training has to incorporate something from you know, my particular yeah. sport and the programming sometimes off, so, you know, so I would take some of that stuff and, and individualize it for yourself and don't yeah. throw out some of the traditional strength training. You don't need to do much of it, but don't throw okay. that out because you'll gain a lot of benefit from that as well. And if you don't hey, have yeah. map strong, by the way, Justin, we'll send that to you. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And that's really what I wanted to hear. If y'all thought that that would be good to supplement with, with my rug training. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Yep. Excellent. Okay. Thanks for calling in, man. Yeah. Thank you very much. No problem. Yeah. Of all of the, I don't know stamina, endurance type sports. This is the one I would I would be yeah. most likely to try. I'm just interested because it's gaining a lot of popularity. It is, and uh, yeah, I, I think uh, th- I mean this was this was like a hunting thing, right? Because yeah. you had to carry. I thought it was a military. I, yeah, definitely military. That's where it came from. But also, I, I've seen because in hunting you have to like oh like carry that, a, it attracts guys that are into hunting and stuff yeah. like that. My 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 best friend's brother. Um, when I first got in it, he was actually doing this a long time ago. I didn't know what the hell it was. He'd like call he he when I was already a trainer, he'd call me up and ask me for advice on his training. He'd be like, yeah, I'm into go ruck. Like, Adam, do you want to ruck? Excuse yeah, me. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Like, I have what? no idea what that is. And then I remember him sending me over the challenges. I'm like, oh shit, this is intense, dude. That's a lot. So it's a it's what would be hard with someone like this is what it limited it to thirty minutes. And the sp- and you're training for like the super long stamina. Yeah, for um, endurance that's rough. But if he if he could get if he could dedicate one day a week for me that he could go spend you know an hour or two towards the endurance aspect of it, I could do it. I could yeah, build it up yeah. like I was to saying. To be honest where- with you, that's what I would do anyway. If I trained for something like this, it would be one day a week of something specific, right? The rest yeah. of it would be more tailored around what I need, you know, with mobility and strength. And then one day a week would be a really long you know, simulated hike with, with weight. Cause honestly doing it more than that or too often might even be too much. Yeah. They're yeah. just breaking down all the time. Totally. Our next caller is Bailey from Minnesota. Hey Bailey, how can we help you? Hey guys. Um, so like everybody else, since <laughs> you've been doing these live Q and A's, I just want to thank you guys. Um, there's actually a huge overlap business wise between what you guys talk about and the work that I do as a musician. Um, so that's been really cool as I've been ramping up um, my my own business and, and career and all of that. So cool. I really appreciate that aspect of things. Um, and then I have a question about body recomp and um, hormone levels and, and what's a realistic and smart expectation of that. 
um, if you guys <laughs> want me to go into like the background, I um, I can. I don't know how much you guys remember from my original submission. Yeah, well, yeah, I we're see actually, it here, but yeah, we're looking at it right yeah. now. Yeah, but I'd like for you to go over it so people can kind of understand what's uh, wh where your question is coming from. Sure, 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 sure. So I um, I am in my late twenties, and I have been lifting consistently for um, about five years. I started off with CrossFit. Um, and then I realized the error of my ways <laughs> and I went in more of a powerlifting direction. Um, but when I started CrossFit, I, um, I gained a ton of weight in a relatively short amount of time while cutting my calories and exercising like six times a week. Um, and Wait, you said it, you gained a, couple, a bunch of weight yeah, or you explain, lost a bunch of weight? I, I gained a bunch of weight. So you cut um, your calories and worked out like crazy and gained weight? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> um, and so I I do have um, a little bit of like disordered eating in, in my background as well. Um, before I had started working out, I had just significantly significantly cut down my my calories and um, I am not in that place anymore. I've like full transparency, like been going to therapy and all of that to address those issues. And that's been really helpful. Um, but I had a bunch of doctors um, tell me things like my weight gain was because of my, my weightlifting and my strength training. Um, and they refused to test hormones. They refused to test my thyroid, all of that stuff. Um, so I had to like go through a lot of doctors and I finally found one that was willing to run those tests. And it came back that, um, my testosterone is like through the floor. Um, and my progesterone and estrogen are also on the low side. So I'm just wondering moving forward, since I am eating to fuel my workouts, um, and I am higher protein and all of that, um, I'm just wondering what a realistic expectation as far as that recomp goes okay, so, and how to approach that in a, in a smart way. Okay. So let's back up for a second. Okay. Cause let's talk about her broken food yep. skill. Yeah. First. Yeah. I know, for, okay. So I want to go back to what you said earlier, cause I want to get this straight here. Correct. We'll try maybe even figure this out. Yeah. You dramatically increased your activity and dramatically cut your calories and gained weight. Mm -hmm. Okay. So were you tracking calories? How did you know that they, the calories changed that dramatically? How much weight did you gain? And was it water, water weight, yeah. blow? Like what, what, what happened about? here? It, so I, I was tracking my calories when I was like in a really disordered place with my eating. And that was as few as like between 900 and 11 calories a day. Okay. And then when I started working out and doing that more consistently. Um, I did get hungrier and I increased those calories to 1400 to 1600. And it, like, despite eating within like a, um, like a whole 30 parameter. So still not super great with, <laughs> with like that food relationship. Um, but despite that I gained like 60 pounds so, Whoa. so you gained 60 yeah. pounds from going from 900 to 1100 calories to 1500 calories plus resistance yeah. training. Mm -hmm. Okay. And, and was this a healthy 60 pounds? Do you feel or did you? No. Okay. Hmm. Okay. No, I think some of it was needed. I think some of it is muscle. Um, but like my body comp right now, I am like around 35% body fat, Okay, which does not reflect my habits. Okay. And then are you on, now you're on hormone therapy? Are they, they supplementing your hormones to bring things back up? Yeah. Mm -hmm. what, and do you mind if I ask what you're taking? Is it testosterone, progesterone, and estrogen or just testosterone? It's, so my functional medicine practitioner is going through more of a holistic protocol before we go through like the, um, through like the, the injection route and, and all of that. Um, so she has me on some more natural supplements and is adjust and is addressing some, um, like vitamin deficiencies that I have. Okay. So you're not, you're not taking any hormones is what you're saying right now. Mm -mm. 
Okay. Are you in our Are you in our mind pump horm- hormones group yet? No. <laughs> okay. That's free. So while we're talking, get your ass in there. That's yeah. The first, uh, just, yeah. Really yep. good experts on hormones in there. Okay. So what it sounds like your functional medicine practitioner is trying to do is get you healthy. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And nutrient deficiencies, overtraining, um, you know, disordered eating can cause a lot of hormonal issues and weird things to happen in the body. Um, and what might have happened with that weight gain was you starved yourself so much that your body was ready to absorb and suck in and store any additional calorie it probably could when you finally started to feed yourself uh, a little mm-hmm. bit more. So that's probably what happened. What? Okay, so your question is about testosterone. Okay, if, you, if your testosterone levels are up and uh, nothing else changes, you can expect to gain muscle and burn body fat. That's a recomp. Okay. Uh, recomp effect that happens from testosterone. It's well documented. But in the studies where that happens, it's supplemental testosterone. Okay. So it's like nothing changes. You give someone testosterone either through injection or cream or pellet, and then you see muscle gain and fat loss. Now, the reason why I'm, I'm trying to be clear with that is because if you raise testosterone naturally, many of the effects that you'll see will come from the things that you're doing to raise the testosterone. And then the t- testosterone goes up. So the difference between raising testosterone naturally and taking exogenous testosterone is with exogenous testosterone, your testosterone is high no matter what. With natural testosterone, you got to change a lot of things in your lifestyle to make that go up. And the things that you change in your lifestyle often result in what you're looking for, which is more muscle, more strength, less body fat, and feeling better. Does this make sense? Yeah. Yeah, it does. I honestly, when my hormone levels came back to my, my doctor, she was kind of surprised that I am as strong as, as I am. Mm. (laughs) Um, so I just, I don't want to put my body back in, in a place where I'm just like beating a dead horse. Bailey, Bailey, besides your functional medicine practitioner, are you Uh, and you don't have to answer this if you don't feel comfortable. Are you working with a therapist that specializes in body image issues and disordered eating? Yep. Okay. That's the best investment I think you can make. Because uh, in order to do what you need to do for your health, and of course, when you get healthy, and this is important for you to understand, when you improve your health, all the other stuff that you're looking for, right? The leaner body, the more strength, looking a particular way or whatever, that will follow the health. Okay, We just did a a whole single topic episode. We did. It'll follow the health. So as you get healthier, the other stuff starts, it trails behind, but it starts to show up as the health improves. And it takes a little longer than the health markers do, but it will follow. And the challenge is going to be being able to do what you need to do and wait that period of time. Patient, patient. And, yeah. and that's why working with a ther- the therapist is by far of all the stuff that you're investing in, probably the best investment because uh, I, I, I mean, uh, there's nothing's going to get in your way like yourself. So that's going to be the biggest obstacle for you. Now, as yeah. far as your, your exercise is concerned. Yeah. What's the training look like? Oh, I would be 100% focused on just feeling good. And if you need to focus on a goal, I would make it strength. And not that you can't get disordered with strength. You can get very dysfunctional with strength too. But it's harder to get stronger while also having your health suffer. It usually, right. and not saying it's not possible, there's plenty of power lifters and bodybuilders out there that do it, but it's it's harder. If your strength gains are going up consistently, it usually means that your health is better off than it was before. It's, if your health is declining, it's hard to also make strength gains. But like I said, it's still possible. It's just harder. So if you have to focus on anything... I would focus on strength. Well, let's dive into that a little bit. What does what your strength training routine look like right now? Like, How many days a week are you training? What's the kind of the breakdown look like? Are you still in the kind of strength focus? Are you running like a five by five? Are you following in the MAPS programs? What are we looking like? Yeah. So I, like once I left CrossFit, I just started doing MAPS programs. So I'm working my way through again right now through uh, MAPS Red. Um, I did your powerlift program like this summer and competed and like had a bunch of fun with that. Oh, cool. Um, yeah. That's great. Yeah. Uh, you're yeah, you're, yeah, you're yeah. on, you're on point. Have you done map strong yet? 
Uh, no, not yet. Oh, you'll love that. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, you'll love Matt. Where you're at right now is great. I'd like to have you an anabolic. Yeah. So anabolic, seeing the therapist, working with the functional practitioner to try and first naturally balance your hormones out. Get in the Mind Pump Hormones forum so that you can sit there and pick the brain of Dr. Ren and Dr. Todd. They're in there all the time answering questions. They're phenomenal. Um, but I, I, it sounds like you, you're you on the right path right now. I think you just uh, need to be patient. Be patient yeah. and don't try and rush this process. And But it sounds like you... You're listening to good people. You're you're in and you're following the right right type of a routine and, and heading the right direction. Yeah. Are you um do, do you follow a lot of influencers and stuff on on social media? Absolutely not. Okay. Thank you. Good. <laughs> in fact, I would say that's get off. Right I would say just don't even go on social media at all. That's a, that's such a no. Um, it sounds toxic like she, place. sounds like she's doing a lot of the right things. You just you, need to be patient. You're you're doing good. Yeah. yeah. You're on you're on the right track, Bailey. And I appreciate you calling in. And uh, you have access to a lot of our programs. Are you in our Are you in our other private forum, the one that costs money to have access to? No, I'm not. All right. We'll let you in there. I would love for you to give us periodic updates um and it's Absolutely. a great place too to get some feedback because i know it's going to be it's a challenging process okay, you won't be alone there's actually plenty of people that are in in a similar boat as you that, that, yes. that are in that forum so we'll let you in there yeah. okay we appreciate you calling that's, thank you that's awesome thank you guys no problem thank you bailey boy that's a that's a uh that's a tough one right um but i think the therapist is going to be her best bet oh man far. she's i mean she's doing all the right things yeah you know, she really is. I mean, she sought that help right away. So that's you know, she she's doing making steps in the right direction. Yeah, you know what this call was for her? She just wants validation. That's yeah. all it is. That's all, everything. I, she's yeah, doing. I think she just wants to make sure. Am I checking all the boxes? And yeah. she literally everything we asked, she said yes to. She's on the right program. She's got a therapist. She's addressing the functional direction first. Yeah. So trying to naturally bring up all her hormone out and balance her hormones out. Um, yeah, I, I, you know, I would not tell her to do it. And the other thing is just to be patient because it, this, just, just folks on getting healthy. Yeah. Step when it, when you, when you, uh, when you hammer those hormones, man, that it could take, and I've seen things flip around. I've seen clients, uh, we change a few things and wham, right away, their body's responding. Yeah. And change. Then I've seen other people. It takes a long time. It does. So you just gotta, you gotta be patient and, and consistent with it. But beyond being on. patient, because sometimes when you say be patient, I think that people think, oh, if I'm patient enough then something's going to happen. I'm going to hit this goal. Mm. But the truth is it's, uh, it's just a lifelong journey and you improve, you continuously improve along the yeah, way. Just keep chipping away at but it. But there is no target. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. She's going to hit a, Oh my God, I did it. I was patient. And now it happened. Cause I think if, if people have that mentality, then it's like, it could be very, very challenging. It's so it's just, a, it's a forever process. And once you accept that, understand that, I think it makes uh, staying on that path a lot easier. Our next caller is Micah from Alabama. Micah, what's happening? How can we help you? Hey, guys. Stoked to be here. Uh, big fan of your podcast and so looking forward to asking my question. So I'll go ahead and jump right into it. So my church is putting on a men's retreat coming up here in March, and which is awesome. Uh, shout out to the Citizens Church in Birmingham, Alabama. But one of the activities that we can that we're going to be doing out there is to run a Spartan race. Now, this is one of the things I've been meaning to do on my bucket list for a long time now, but it also comes at a very tough time for for me as far as training goes. So to give you a little bit of background, I became a dad for the first time about eight months ago, which is awesome. Best experience of my life. But also it has limited my training. So before I became a dad, I was doing split training with a little bit of cardio sprinkled in. But ever since I've become a dad, I've limited my training to about two to three times a week at this point, doing full body training based mainly on what you guys have told me in the podcast. And I've gotten a lot of good results with that, but I know in order to run the Spartan race, I'm going to need to change things up. Most of the training programs that I've seen have said that you need to do training about four to five times a week, which is not realistic for me at this time. But so I got to basically keep it to two to three times a week. And I'm wondering, and my questions are this one, is it realistic for me you need to train for this Spartan race only training two to three times a week? And secondly, if it is, how should I prioritize endurance training versus strength training in order to prepare for this? Yeah. Good question. So uh, you're, you're limited to two or three days a week, right? That's what we're working with. And uh, now is it realistic? Is it realistic to train for this race that way? Yeah, it's realistic. I don't know if it's going to make you the best version of yourself, but can you do it in three days a week? You definitely can. 
the way that I would organize it is one day a week would be traditional strength training with maybe some mobility. The other two days a week would be very obstacle course racing specific where you're practicing the events and the runs and the, you know, the rings and the, all the, all the movements and, and activities you'll be doing in the race. I would do that, that, that the other two days a week. And I think with the three day kind of limitation that we have, that would probably be the best way that I would organize a workout. Yeah. I actually think that, um, you could totally do this. Uh, so a, a 10 K Spartan race is, is a little over six miles, right? So, you know, if you if you build enough endurance to get through six miles and then incorporate some of the things like grip strength and pull ups and things carrying things, which obstacle course racing has got in there. We have a maps OCR program, so I'll have Doug send that over to you. Uh, it is a little more than just two days a week. So you can but what you can do is take you pull from it. Yeah, pull two mm -hmm. of those days out of there. And then what I would do is every uh, every day before I start my routine, I would run one mile. And then uh, try to on the weekends or once a week go get uh, one one of those weekends. I try and get a two mile run in, which we're, ho hopefully this doesn't take, but you know, fifteen twenty minutes of your time. Uh, another day or another day or another week, I should say, I would do a three mile, and then at the end of the month, I would try and do a six mile run. And combining that uh, with the two days a week of like a full body strength routine that incorporates the pull ups and carries and things like that, I think you could actually do pretty damn well at the Spartan race. Yeah, what's nice about the OCR one, that program that we came up with too, it also has mobility sessions in there to kind of complement a lot of these uh, grip intensive type of um, events and, and, obstacles that are in front of you so there's also a way to kind of scale that in terms of grip strength so you can perform well while doing these and building up your endurance so just to, like they said just kind of pull and extract uh some of these workouts from the program and i think you can you can strategically uh get a lot out of that just with three days a week on the days that do endurance do you believe that since I get off very late on some nights, do you think it would be realistic to do it on a treadmill or an elliptical versus running outside every time? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, if you have yeah. to, it's, you're better. You're, look, the, the closer you can get to what the race is going to be like, the better. But if you can't do that, then you can try simulating it on a piece of equipment. You a totally and a that. treadmill would be better than elliptical in this case. It's yeah. going to simulate running, obviously, better than elliptical. But yeah, no, I absolutely. The big thing is going to be your gas tank. That's what you're. In fact, I think yeah. in, in Maps OCR, I mean, we wrote that program a while ago, but I think we have treadmill specific yeah. workouts mm -hmm. in there. So and there's tests there. in there too that you kind of work up to. So I would probably you know look into that for like uh, you know once a month uh, you kind of test it out and see mm -hmm. where where you stand in terms of your time and everything. So that way you have some kind of a gauge as far as how your programming is is paying off. We just talked to somebody similar. Like to, you'd be amazed by how how much you can improve your cardiovascular endurance just yeah. by simply running a mile or two every time you go to work out. And that really shouldn't take up a lot of your time to do that. And, you know, week over week, you'll, you'll quickly see yourself start to improve on that time. Um, and then you only need to, you know, once or twice a month, do something that's even close to comparable as far as the distance. So yeah. saying, you know, four to six miles once or twice a month. Uh, so like one of those days you, you take off for, you know, 20 minutes and, and do a run. You do that consistently uh, leading up to the competition. You're, and then if you're also incorporating exercises that are going to challenge grip and pull-up strength and carrying, which is in OCR, uh, you, you're going to do fine, man. You'll yeah. do great. Yeah, we'll send over Maps OCR for you so you can you have some stuff to pull from. Okay, Michael? All right. Excellent. Thank nope. you, guys. No problem. Congratulations on being a new dad. Shout out. One, you helped me so much in my personal life because I'm starting to listen to your podcast about this close to the time I became a dad and you guys really taught me how to balance out fitness alone with being a dad at the same time. And secondly, you also guys also helped me out in my career. I'm a physical therapy assistant here at the VA and a lot of the things you taught me, I'm able to apply as both as a physical therapist and a health coach here. So I want to say thank you guys for everything that you do. Oh, thank you, Mike. I appreciate really yeah. appreciate that. Boy, these, uh, these obstacle course, course races are so popular now. They're just, they're doing them everywhere yeah. yeah well they're uh, fun i guess so. yeah getting outside getting dirty like getting after i think it just has its own appeal in terms of like doing something completely outside your comfort zone yeah and so yeah. I, I also think that yes if you're advanced you're probably going to be training five days a week or so but 
most people can make tremendous progress with a few days a week. Like at some point you may reach the point where you need to add an extra day, but I think people, they, they, you know, they overestimate that. Oh, I need to add an extra day. It's like, there's a lot you could do with these three days a week before you add more time. There's this misconception of, you know, more means you're going to get more results. It does. You could, you can get plenty of progress, especially what I'm talking about. 10 K is only six miles. Mm Mm-hmm. So to get somebody good at, at running for six miles, yeah. it, it doesn't take as that much time and effort towards that. I mean, you can you can, and you don't also have to do it every time. He doesn't do. He doesn't go out and run six miles every day to get good at running six miles. You can break it up in one mile, two mile, three mile type totally. of increments and improve that every week. Totally. Look, if you like our information, head over to mindpumpfree.com and check out all of our guides. We have guides that can help you with almost any fitness goal. You can also find all of us on Instagram. So Justin is at mindpumpjustin. I'm at Mind Pump Sal and Adam is at Mind Pump Adam.